Welcome back to the Leverage Podcast, where our goal is simple, to learn from the best and discover how we can all live a better life, build a more fruitful business, and be more productive. Join us each week as we interview fellow entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and leading experts to discuss everything from marketing secrets to new technology and life as an entrepreneur. Hey guys, welcome back to the Leverage Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Sonnenberg. Today's guest is extremely famous, special, genius, I don't know other words to explain him, and that's Dan Sullivan, co-founder of Strategic Coach. Dan's known for coaching more entrepreneurs than anyone else on the face of the earth. But before going into that episode, I just wanted to address the fact that we have paused the podcast for the last couple months, and I just wanted to talk about that before we start this episode. We paused for... I don't know, two or three months now. And that's basically because at Leverage, we're constantly re-examining our systems and processes so that we can operate as efficiently as possible. And we do this in every department from HR to operations, to marketing, to podcasting. So we took a step back so we could really improve the quality of this podcast. We've had really, really positive feedback from people. And we wanted to, we wanted to take this podcast to the, to the next level. So for the foreseeable future, we're going to be releasing two episodes a week that we've recorded in the past. This episode actually was recorded back in April. So uh, we had a bit of a backlog, but everything is more relevant than ever. And we're going to be up-leveling the quality of our production. Also, people have reached out over the past year or two asking questions about the service offerings of Leverage. So let me just address that really quickly too before we start the episode. So we are no longer a virtual assistant company. We pivoted or repositioned fully earlier this year. We now are a growth agency. We help businesses maximize their top line revenue by doing high level marketing strategy and execution. It could be sales funnels, blogs, podcasts like this, content creation, design, landing pages, SEO, paid media, paid search. But we also help businesses with bottom line revenue where that is helping businesses operate as efficiently as possible. How do you communicate, collaborate as efficiently as possible to maximize team productivity and efficiency? And during this coronavirus, one of the things that a lot of businesses have been using leverage for is helping them to go remote. And going remote can look very different depending on how you do it. But we help people go remote in an efficient way so that you maintain culture while you're remote, but also you don't have all that productivity loss that that you might be concerned with. So I hope that that answers everyone's questions related to leverage. Now, we're going to also be experimenting with different formats of the podcast. So please write in, give us feedback on how you're liking things. If there's any special guests, any special content, we would really love to hear from you. As always, we would love you to rate this podcast, share it, subscribe. We really want to invest in growing the audience and the quality so we can have more reach because honestly, people need this content and these services now more so than ever during the pandemic and during a situation where people are really struggling to figure out how they can actually still operate their business while being remote. And we really want to get this out to as many people as possible. Another quick thing to check out is we're creating now a page for the podcast. So getleverage.com slash podcast is where you're going to be able to find all upcoming as well as previous podcasts, show notes, resources, as well as additional goodies. So please check that out. And that's it. So I really hope that you enjoy today's episode. Like I said, it's with Dan Sullivan. He's literally a genius. He's one of the most well-respected entrepreneur coaches on the face of the earth. No one has coached more people than him. I'm a new proud member of Strategic Coach. So please enjoy the episode. Most people would call Dan a genius, including myself. Dan is really a special thinker and someone that I really look up to and proud to say that we're going to be a collaborator going forward and really excited about being one, a new member of Strategic Coach and two, working with you and and the team on collaborating. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Nick. And, uh, you know, our teamwork couldn't have happened at a better time. 
I was thinking over the last two months about entrepreneurs who would actually speed up their business. And your name came up very, very high on the list. I said, I bet Nick's getting a lot of calls. I bet Nick's getting a lot of new projects. (laughs) One thing I'm passionate about is the future of work. And I've been talking about remote work. I mean, our conversations over the last year have been, how does technology impact how work is done? And now it's kind of highlighting how important technology is going to play in the future of of work. I mean, you always expected this to happen one day, that there would be a a widespread recognition that remote work has many, many advantages. What has surprised you most about the speed where things have happened? I'm surprised that so many people didn't have even a minimum setup Mm -hmm. is surprising, right? So when someone says to me, oh, well, I don't have Wi-Fi at home or I have a bad connection and can't connect to Zoom, It's one thing to be set up with fancy tools and automation and Slack and Asana and these things, but I guess I was surprised that so many people didn't even have the capability or knowledge of getting a connection to Zoom from their living room. I think I've also been surprised, well, not, I guess, yes and no, but how many business models are changing right now because of this. So aside from the technology, I'm seeing a lot of business models completely shifting. What about you, though? I'm curious your thoughts on this. Well, it was interesting. I remember a conversation I had with my mother. She's been dead for a couple of decades, but she was born in 1910. And her family went through the very famous Spanish flu, which was from 1918 to 1921. As many as 60 million, conservatively about 50 million people who died worldwide of the Spanish flu. But my mother told me that her family had been quarantined for three months. They couldn't come in or out of their house for three months. So I was asking her, you know, how that worked and, you know, who did the work and how how did it work? And then I, at the end, I said, so what would you say is the biggest change that happened? And she said about halfway through the three months, we realized it was time for our house to get a telephone. (laughs) <laughs> and and that, I got curious about that. And I went back and I looked at the, you know, telephone adoption and it just, there was just a, you know, it was just a, a jump that happened from around 1918 to you know, over the next four or five, five years. And so kind of a similar situation, but telephone was the, you know, and the telephone had really been around for about 30 years. So it's not like it was a brand new innovation. But it was mostly for businesses, you know, most uh, business, wealthy people had phones and, you know, the uh, business community had phones. But then I think it really shot up that people who just were normal householders would have phones mm-hmm. because you were so handicapped by not being able to communicate. What were some of the positives that came out of the Spanish flu? I'm anticipating a lot of positives to come out of this. I think that Obviously, it's scary times, so to speak, right now, and a lot of people are in panic mode. But I do think that you know this is going to accelerate quite a lot. And I'm just curious, from what your mother shared with you, what were some of the positives that came out of that, if any? Well, I think uh, what happened immediately is border controls went in and anybody coming into the country, they were testing for disease. You know, they were testing. But it was actually the nursing profession shot up there because... It was actually nurses who did most of the work. I mean, this is worldwide. A lot of the deaths were just due to the fact that uh, one of the places that hit big time was Europe, and Europe had just been destroyed by the First World War. So there was a general civic breakdown, you know, water supplies were, you know, they didn't have water supplies, electricity was down. So I think it was just a general dropping of civic capability that caused a lot of the deaths. and. Uh, you know, they've been overwhelmed by the death tolls from the First World War. You know, medicine really wasn't advanced in the, in those days. You know, I was born in 1944, and it wasn't really all that advanced in the 1940s. But they did have like penicillin and everything like that. But I think that one of the main things that always increases very, very quickly is use of technology. And I think it would be probably telephones would be obvious because my mother said so. But I think electrification was the same thing. You know, things weren't as electrified Mm -hmm. as they had been. General sanitation went in big time. You know, you started having sewer systems and connections to the house, indoor plumbing, probably. I think all these things went in because people had three months with a lack and 
it powerfully motivates you to make some improvements afterwards. And what are you seeing right now? I mean, you have an interesting perspective. You're coaching so many people. You have optics and a lens across so many entrepreneurs, so many industries, so many sizes. What are you hearing and seeing right now? Yeah, you know, I've got a split perspective. It's like I'm viewing life on two different planets right now. Because on the one hand, daily, I'm in contact with, uh, you know, on average, I'm in contact with at least 50 entrepreneurs every day in groups and individually. I have to tell you, it's been mostly upbeat, very, very upbeat, very optimistic, appreciating changes that they're able to make very, very quickly, spotting new value creation propositions that they can help their clients and customers with really taking a look for the first time at, you know, remote teamwork in a way that they've never done before and have been surprised. They've been gratified by the speed with which you can get things done teamwork-wise, you know, right up your alley. You know, I mean, just in my client base, I could probably keep leverage busy for the next two or three years, which, you know, (laughs) I mean, you've got your interest of what what kind of projects you want to take on, but it won't be for a lack of desire on the part of our client base. I'm looking at it and the very calm, uh, one of the biggest things, I've never seen my entrepreneurs as calm as they are. They were saying that their team members and their families are actually reflecting on the fact, you've never been this calm before. And I think entrepreneurs sort of hyper-focus when something like this happens and they you know, they just shed a lot of annoyances. They, they just zero in on, you know, important issues. So I think their sense of priority has gone up. Okay, so that's one experience. That's one planet. The other planet is I'm a news junkie. And so every day I'm spending a couple hours uh, looking at the, you know, how it's being reported at the highest levels of the media here in Canada. I look at a British daily, the Telegraph, every every morning. And then You know, I check, you know, I've got about 10 different spots on the internet that I check in. And all the articles are almost uh, uniformly negative, communicating fear. And so I've been, it took me a while to sort this out in my mind, Nick. And I realized that almost all the media who are reporting negativity have been almost killed by Facebook and Google with their advertising. So when they say it looks like a world is coming to an end, I think they're just projecting the world that they live in. And I think at the leadership levels generally, if you take what we consider the traditional leadership, political leadership, corporate leadership, and everything else, I think they're completely out of touch with what's happening at the ground level. They're being bypassed. I think there's an enormous number of bypasses that are being created right now just by people getting together, making new kind of connections, coming up with new projects, developing new capabilities. And I think the biggest worry on the part of traditional, mostly bureaucratic leadership is they know there are parades forming, but they don't know how to get out in front as if they're leading that. You just said a key word for me, which is capabilities. What kind of skills or capabilities do you think are going to be essential for this new world that we're moving into? You know, being in community, I think, is the biggest one. I think everybody who's scared is feeling very isolated. And the people who feel confident have the uh, strength of personal community. They have the strength of teamwork community. They've created communities out of their clients and customers. So I think there's a real, it's almost binary The people who really know how to form community and to take advantage of community are feeling very, very confident. I mean, there's challenges. There's no question about challenges, but they have a lot of support. And the other individuals are kind of like isolated individuals who never were were really good at community. I think it must be, be very, very scary for someone who doesn't have the mindset to actually kind of find strength in numbers. When you say community, though, are you also referring to your team as part yeah. of your community? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Makes the sense. team is one of my communities. I've got a unique community with my free zone. I've got about 50 very, very innovative top entrepreneurs, and we've been totally connected. I've done about anywhere from eight to 18 at a time. And then just generally, we've really been connected to our all the entrepreneurs who are in the program. We have about 3,000 and all over. I mean, I, I, I had a two-hour 
mini workshop yesterday and I had I had five from Australia and they were watching at 3.30 and 4.30 in the morning. It's uh, very, very gratifying mm-hmm. and they definitely feel part of something that's bigger, you know, and that they're getting a lot, a lot of positive feedback. But uh, where it's not working, and I see this, is people who just feel isolated, you know, and it doesn't matter whether they're rich, poor, mi- middle class. There are some people who just don't have a great ability to gain confidence and gain a sense of direction from other people. And I think it's a very difficult time right now for them. Yeah. One of the things that I always talk about with in respect to technology and why remote is so valuable and important is it's not just enough to say, you know, Zoom or you know how to text and now you could be remote. But like if you actually know, you don't need to know a hundred of them, but just a few principles and few core tools, it allows you to have clients you know, in Australia. So now you're able to add value and help people that otherwise would never, or it would be very hard for them to come to Chicago or something if they're in Australia. So that's one thing, but also from a team perspective, it allows you to work with people remotely. So you can now tap into talent pools in other parts of the world. Um, If you have good systems, it brings people up to speed faster or it de-risks you because knowledge is captured in a certain way. A statistic that I found out recently, if you look at employee turnover in companies over the last decade or two, the rate of turnover is exponentially increasing. So 20 years ago, say the, I don't know the exact number, but the average might've been six years in a job. Now it's like two years. And so as that accelerates the need for having good information capture and the ability to bring people up to speed is critical. And my point that I'm trying to make, or the question that I'm leading to is, my understanding, Coach is now celebrating what? It's 30th year in business? We're in 31. We're in the 30th. 30, 31. Yeah. And, you know, you have an amazing team. You have been able to retain people. I mean, Shannon's been with you, like, what, 25 years or something? 29. This is our 29. Yeah. That, to me, is an amazing accomplishment because it's not easy to keep your team together. So I'm wondering, what's your secret trick here? Or what do you think led to that in terms of culture or how you were able to do that? Well, I have a real commitment to the thing that you're talking about. I mean, if I if you have good people, I'd like to keep them forever. So that's just a commitment that both Babs. But first of all, this is a partnership that, that started Strategic Coach. So Bab Smith and we're we have totally different uh, capabilities. Babs is terrific at creating teams. The truth of the matter is that she runs the company and I run what we call the program, which is the actual offering to, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the coaching, the coaching program we come from. I think it may have to do with our, how we were born because both of us are late children. So Babs is the fourth of fifth, fourth of five children, and I'm the fifth of seven children. A lot of the entrepreneurs are first, firstborns, you know, what we notice probably about half our client base are probably firstborns. So Babs and I have had the experience of being big, active, involved families growing up before we ever got out into the world. And I think the big thing is that we just have a natural knack of how you create a family-like feeling inside of a company. You know, I I hadn't really given it a lot of thought, but it uh, the numbers that we have, like right now, we, you know, our total team, which is well over 100, we know 60% of them are beyond 10 years. And I think we have 25 beyond 20 years. That's one factor, you know, just our intention that that be so. But the other thing is that the core concept in coach is what we call unique ability that we're just interested in what the person is really great at and what they would love doing all the time. And we work from the moment that they come into the company to get them to the point where 100% of their time can just be in kind of a sweet spot for them. But there's two things. One, they have to take it seriously. I mean, if, if I take your unique ability more seriously than you do, you aren't going to be around here very long. And the other thing is that in addition to focusing on what you're great at, you're able to do great teamwork with other people who are doing the same thing. I think part of it is just a competitive advantage in the marketplace. If they decide to go someplace else, they're never going to get this deal. There's nobody else who's going to let you do just what you love doing and has a commitment to you doing that. The other thing is that we we have a interesting free time, what other people would call vacation. We just call them free days. 
so you join us, you're on trial for the first three months because there's kind of like a no fault in US, Canada and Great Britain where we have our organizations three months and you can fire without cause really, you know, it's a test. So, but starting that point in the first year, you get six weeks of free days, you get six weeks. You could be in your 29th year and you still get six weeks of free days. So we don't use free days as a form of compensation. But what we want is that people have a life outside of a strategic coach. And we find that six, six weeks really handles it. And there's some rules how you can take them and what has to be true. There has to be someone double trained for your job. You have to take them all during that year. We give you an extra month into the next year. But if you didn't take them, you lose them. So I think the combination of the emphasis on unique ability, unique ability, teamwork, you know, we have a very family-like feeling about the company. And then the uh, free day policy, I, th- I think we create sort of, uh, ain't going to get this anywhere else. You're not going to get yeah. this. And then a lot of our hiring is affiliation. That's people who know about Strategic Coach and they apply. So there's a certain responsibility if someone brought you into the company I that see. you, you want to perform yes. most. I think without knowing it, we sort of fell into these strategies. Yeah. And after a while, we looked at what the difference, we heard our staff talk about it and everything like that. Yeah, I'm a great believer in, you know, if you got a good relationship, just keep it forever. Yeah. Um, well, I know like when you've talked about collaborations and stuff, when you're collaborating with people, it's with the intent of a 25-year time horizon. So you're, you is it fair to say you're a long-term thinker? Yeah, really, really long. And I think it's because I'm a late developer. I was in my 40s before I had any idea what I was good at, you know. I mean, <laughs> and so I, I've always oh. had a feeling that I'm making up in my 70s what I missed in my 30s, you know. Well, a lot of people never figure it out. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> better late than never. With hiring, I'm just curious, this is me just being curious, but do you do any outbound recruiting or is most of the people that work at Strategic Coach coming from a referral or more like inbound requests like, hey, are you looking for anyone? I have a great believer that if you're a salesperson, you should never hire anyone because you treat it like a sales, uh, like a sales opportunity. And I I don't think salespeople make good hirers. I mean, all the people who hire in my my company could win at poker in Las Vegas. You know, they they don't give away anything (laughs) whether this is good or that bad. I would have to check with that, uh, you know, where it is. I, I knew perhaps what it was 10 years ago, but right now. But I, I, I think we use the agencies. I, you know, I, I think they come in through agencies and we require the agencies to do uh, very, very extensive screening before they even put someone in contact with us. So more yeah. and more we're stipulating, you know, we're clear and clear. And we say, if it doesn't look like this, don't send the person. And most, a lot of it's mindset. I would say that mindset is if there's two or three factors, I would say mindset is really the most important factor. Would they like the culture? You know, would they, you know, are they lone wolves? Uh, you yeah. Know. The other thing, are they big, uh, you know, we're looking for big picture people. You know, if the, <laughs> it's so funny because we've hired a lot of millennials, um, you know, and there's all this cultural thing about millennials, you know. So the person who does the main hiring, who's in charge, and she's been with us about 20 years, I said, I'm noticing the millennials, they don't have any of the so-called millennial attitudes, you know, that I've heard about. And uh, I said, do you do anything different with them than you did before with other people? And she says, I think I do. She says, I ask him one question. I said, what's the question? She says, if you come to work at Strategic Coach, what do you think you're entitled to? And she hmm. said, if they answer the question, they're gone. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I think I'm entitled. <laughs> You're gone. But if they huh. say, well, I don't think I'm entitled to anything. I just want an opportunity, you know, to get work experience and work at a, you know, really work as a team member. Good. That doesn't mean they're hired, but it means they won't be rejected at that, uh, at that point. So it's a sense of entitlement and Boy, I mean, you come into coach with a sense of entitlement. It goes, you know, like the, I mean, the sirens go go off and usually they're, you know, they're gone before three months, you know. One thing, I don't know if I ever shared this story with you, but I used to be a high frequency trader and we used to have, I think it was like seven weeks of vacation a year. But what was interesting was 
if you're in the front office, they force you to take two weeks as a block leave out of the seven. So you could do seven weeks, but you have to take two weeks consecutively. They shut you out of everything. And they, the, the primary reason is to make sure that you're not hiding trades. But by forcing people out of systems for two weeks, it's a great way to stress test that your processes are well documented, that you have backups in place. And what always happened every year for eight years for me was I could be the world's expert at an algorithm or, or trading strategy, but there was always an improvement when I came back because fresh eyes spark innovation. So one thing that we always do every quarter at Leverage is we always, you know, we, we try to balance what activities or key projects are going to be revenue generating and what are going to be risk reducing. And we, you know, I think depending on the life cycle, we're still an early stage company. So we, the ratio has to be much more heavily geared towards revenue generating than risk reducing, but we always allocate some portion to risk reducing projects. And that always entails, Hey, what, what role are we going to switch for a week? Like it could be a process that we're going to stress test. So it could be payroll as this you, quarter. Uh, could you explain to me what the risk type of thing is uh, that you're well, talking about? There's many different types of risk, but like one risk could be that only one person knows how to do payroll. What happens if that person gets sick, leaves the company, decide, you know, can't reach them. People still need to get paid, right? So that's one form uh, of risk. Yeah. If you have, I mean, other things, I mean, I look at risk in many different ways. Like how is the distribution of our revenue? Do we have concentration risk? Or if you know the top three clients were to quit, what would that impact our revenue or other yeah. things? Like it's one thing, it's one thing to say that you've two or 10 X your revenue this year, but what was the path to do it? Was it a jagged line or a smooth line? And there's like the concept of sharp ratio, which is your return adjusted for risk. So I'm looking at a lot of different risks, but this one in particular is really around the risk of a key team member leaving yeah. or getting sick. Um, like another risk, I'll just share this with you. When COVID came about, we had a risk assessment day at, at the company where we sat down for basically a half a day and we just, what are all the risks that we're not thinking about that could actually happen, right? So yeah. one, one risk was, well, we, if, and this is a bit technical, but it just highlights an example where if Salesforce rotates what's called a token and we're using Salesforce, only the developer knows how to fix that issue. And if by coincidence, they rotate it in, the three, in a three month time period, that so happens that Josh, our developer is sick and can't do anything, our whole system could just go down and like we couldn't access anything. So those are the types of, when I say risk, yeah. it's, it could take yeah. different forms. No, I totally get it. I mean, it's all the downside part. I tell you, we uh, did a very interesting thing when I turned 70, which was in 14, so 2014. We have company meetings uh, live uh, twice a year, and now we've adapted doing uh, Zoom. So we did two in the last, probably in the last four weeks we've done. And we're stretching from London on the east, London, England, to Los Angeles on the west. So we're Across eight time zones, uh, we've got staff represented over there. So I got up and I said, first of all, I said, I don't know if any of you are thinking of this, but, you know, I'm 70 and I don't even know if your parents are 70. And I don't know if you know anybody 70, but maybe some of you are thinking, gee, I wonder how long the old guy is going to stick around. You know, I said, I, I won't ch get a show of hands here, but. I'm just uh, saying that probably it's occurred to you. So I said, uh, first of all, I'm totally committed that I'm going to be doing workshops 25 years from now, and they're going to be better than the ones I'm doing right now. Don't know what the fees are, but we'll find out along the way. But, you know, Babs and I fly everywhere together. You know, like I don't take a trip where Babs isn't with me, and it's about 45 a year. And I said, so... What would happen if you got the news one morning that we had died in a plane crash? And I said, first of all, for how many of you would that be bad news? I'm taking names here. And I said, then I said, but there's two types of bad news. You get the bad news and it would be bad news. But the worst kind of bad news is you wouldn't have the foggiest idea what to do. A better bad news would be it's bad news, but you know exactly what to do. So I said, I think we ought to give some thought to this. So we went through about a three year process with legals and, you know, the legal structure of the company and who the successors would be in the financial structure. 
you know, and how everything would paid for it. But the most important one, we did an exercise called the first hundred days. And I said, you know, what's important isn't what you would do during the first year or the first three years. It's actually what you would do during the first hundred days, because whatever you did there, it would create, you know, the pattern. And we took our top 20. We were about 100 right then. And we took uh, maybe 95. And we took our top 20 who really were the key. You know, they were the key leaders and key influencers. We did this thing where they reviewed everything good about what they had done so far, what they were working on right now, what they were planning to work on. So they get a sense of all the different things they'd have to pay attention to. And then we said, so, but just during the first hundred days, what would five things be that you would just focus on? And uh, Nick, it was really interesting because it was exactly the same for all 20 people. They did exactly the same thing. And then Babs and I- What was that? Yeah, Babs and I met with each of them an hour, hour and a half on their own. They immediately reverted just to their unique ability. In other words, they said, I, I can't pay any attention to uh, anything on my unique ability, and I can only focus on what concerns my team. You know, I have to focus on my team. And the second thing is that we want a lot of Dan on the shelf if that ever happens. And that's when I went into a hyperdrive with uh, knocking out a book a quarter. Uh, I've got 10 podcast series and I'm just stockpiling concept after concept after concept after concept. Because I could tell after Steve Steve Jobs died, when was the quarter that Tim Cook ran ran out of Steve? There wasn't any more Steve on the shelf. Mm. And you could tell the difference. You could tell the difference. It's a problem. I mean, You know, it's a it's a problem. But now the thing that's happened is I now have a team that can produce new intellectual copy. Uh, they can create new products, include new exercises. They can, you know, they can do podcasts and everything else. They can do books and everything like that. And people said, well, how do you want them to perform afterwards? And I said, what do I care? I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you don't buy life insurance either, do you? No. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm very, joking. very big in life insurance. I have to just tell joking. you, no, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, well, well, but the, the big thing is that well, that's the huge risk is what happens when the owners, you know, the owners, uh, the owners just suddenly die or they're removed, you know, and you haven't set up leadership, you haven't set up succession, you haven't set up the legal structure. And I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs play a really ga- a good game and lose, lose the game on the final play, you know. Well, a couple points from this. One, um, in terms of your age and, and your vision of how long you want to work, I have no doubt that you will achieve that because after seeing you and only you and Lee Brower are the two that I don't want to be in a gym next to because you, I remember at Joe Polish's Genius Network, the two of you just made me look, I was just embarrassed to be in the gym with you guys. You were just killing it on that Stairmaster or the, the treadmill. I was like, who is that? You were about You were about to break it. That was pretty impressive. But you brought up a few times now unique ability and tools, and now your team is able to create its own IP. Yeah. And you're creating so much IP. What is your process to create IP? I'm guessing you're, you're exposed to so many entrepreneurs. I'm sure you're hearing things and that triggers, but yeah. do you have a formal process with how you distill a concept like from idea to, okay, now it's in a book? Like, What is your process for creating these tools? Well, I think that the start of it is a commitment that we're, we will always be coming up with new stuff. And I think, uh, you know, we have, I have right now about 25 clients who are within 12 months of being in the program for 30 years. So it's not just team members I'd like to keep forever. I'd like to keep my clients forever, the best clients. It's kind of interesting. It must be a bit like the entertainment industry. There's There's a part of people want that are oldies, but goodies, you know, it's like uh, Paul, you know, Paul McCartney could do anything he wants, but if you go to a concert and he doesn't uh, play yesterday, they won't come back, you know? And so my sense is that there's a certain number of uh, things that we've created in the past that they want again. It's a, it's a, there's kind of a reassurance thing to it, but they want new stuff. And I would say that every quarter it's got to be 80% new or you won't keep them. And we've just equated creativity with renewals. You know, we looked at renewals. It's not the only factor about renewals, but it's certainly an important one. 
so there's the commitment to creating new stuff. And I think the other thing is I, I'm extraordinarily deadline driven. So if I've got a deadline to create something new, I create it. And I don't create it if there isn't a deadline. So I, I self-impose deadlines and then the process itself. And it's usually a quarter. Everything happens within a quarter. But the other thing is, Nick, and this is uh, the great new concept we have, which is called simplifier multiplier, is that my life is just incredibly simpler in year 31 of the program than it was when we first started, because I had to do a lot of different things, you know, to grow the company. You know, you not only have to create something, but you have to get out there and sell it. As far as formal selling or formal marketing, I've been pretty well relieved of that. And then even in the creative process, there's certain things that I do and that uh, I've got two skills and I was in advertising. I, I worked for one of the big ad agencies, BBDO, big uh, global. I did the Toronto office here. I really learned a lot of production techniques and uh, uh, production teamwork in, in the ad agency. And so as much as possible, I just do a part of any project and then I have like the books, uh, it's a 10-person team. The podcast team is about five people in the podcast. So wherever it's not, I'm not absolutely required, somebody else is going to do that. So that, you know, and that's a lot of what you teach, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, and then there's constant elimination of steps, you know, as you repeat something over and over, you notice that there's extraneous steps, you know, you don't have to do that. We can bypass that. Totally. We- we can shortcut it. And what I noticed, you know, I'm a fiction reader and I've got some favorite. I'm mostly into homicide detectives and international intrigue, uh, you know, espionage <laughs> and everything like that. But there's about 10 uh, writers and I love them because you, uh, at the minimum, you'll get a brand new book every year, almost on schedule. And so I started getting interested in how they do that. And I said, geez, how do how they, I mean, these are not small books. They're, you know, three or 400 pages and they're factories. I mean, they, they, they've got a factory going, they got sort of rough writers, you know, writers who just rough things out. They've got researchers, I mean, everything and nothing important in the world happens on a one person basis anymore. You know, it's all teamwork. So I've just gone to that. I do it for the program. I, you know, I, I don't write books to be a famous writer. I don't do podcasts to be a famous podcaster. I do it to propel the ideas of the program. So I'm very, very, you know, all my focus from IP is just to grow the program and to uh, create yeah. tools that other people can coach. I'm number like five. It. I'm a fifth child, you know. <laughs> when you're a fifth child, you know, you're not number one, you're not number. <laughs> so is the number one, uh, the multipliers and the number five, more the simplifiers? It's really interesting because, you know, we use various profiles. You know, there's some really excellent profiles that you'd be better doing this than doing this, you know, that and Colby is really a good one. We've been using Kathy Colby created this profile. Uh, left to your own devices, how do you naturally take action to get your results? So are you someone who has to do a lot of research first? Are you someone who has to put a system yeah. together first? Or do you just take action? Or We had our whole team take that test. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, you know, I mean, the most predominant thing is I'm a quick start. I'm a 10 on the scale. I'm a 10 quick start. But Babs, my partner, is a 9. So we're almost carbon copies uh, of each other. And yet, uh, when it comes to the simplifier, so simplifier is someone who takes complexity and makes a much simpler explanation of something. And a multiplier looks for things that are really simple that they can take out to the world. A good example would be the McDonald brothers and Ray Kroc. Donald brothers came up with this really neat design for you know a really cool hamburger joint and then they had two of them but if they hadn't met rick crack they never would have had a third one and ray crack said well i don't want to i don't want to fool around with the design i would just like to get the design out to as many people as possible and i've seen wherever there's magic in the world where something really grows at the bottom of it you usually find a teamwork between a simplifier and a multiplier it takes different forms but you have to have that capability 
So Babs is almost the same from a Colby standpoint, but uh, she's a hundred percent multiplier and I'm a hundred percent simplifier. Yeah, I, I can relate. I, I would call myself more of a simplifier as well. And oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 if so you, I, I, if you've been confused let me let, let, yeah. me, clar, let me clarify things i mean the first time i met you i was yeah and, <laughs> and, and it's really really interesting because i think ari was too yeah. yeah he he was more of a quick start and i was a fact finder but yeah you know it's it's hard to scale complexity right if you have broken processes or can't scale complexity you can't scale complexity a lot of people, I feel, make the mistake when they when they get stuck and they don't have bandwidth to execute, they think, oh, well, let's just hire more people. But yeah. if you add more people to an inefficient system, it's gonna it could hurt you. This diagram shows how complexity scales exponentially with team size. So if you're in Facebook Live, you're seeing this. And if you're listening on the podcast, shoot us an email and we'll send you this. But uh, we'll post it in the Facebook group, making remote work actually work. This highlights when you're a three-person team, there's three ways to connect. When you're a four-person team, there's six no, there's six ways that information can be passed around, and you could see it's it's not linear; it's exponential. When you're up to yeah. four, a team of fourteen, there's ninety-one ways to connect. So yeah. this is what gets me going. Is this is why I'm so passionate about all the operational efficiency and not just individual productivity, but team productivity. Because in an organization or a team. Every person that you add, there's exponentially more complexity. There's more ways that information and communication can get lost, more ways that documents and process and knowledge can slip through the cracks. So it's without simplifying and having a framework with how things work, it's extremely difficult to bring in that multiplier, so to speak, and scale it, right? Well, you know, I can really attest to what you're saying here. And it's a very, very painful lesson because I'm kind of a, a an out loud thinker. Team setting, I said, you know, I've been thinking maybe we could do this and this. And I just realized that the words weren't out of my mouth and I had just created an enormous amount of complexity. You know, say there were 10 people at the, you know, in the meeting. And I just created a massive amount of complexity because, first of all, you're not equal in rank in a company. You know, there's no company where you're equal in rank. And the boss just has an idea. That means that I'm going to have to adjust my priorities because something's coming. But I hadn't committed to it. I was just thinking out loud. And uh, so about uh, five years ago, I made a vow that uh, I would never brainstorm in public ever I won't even brainstorm in public with one person. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And what I do is I have a forum, and you sent me one before the presentation. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you send a quick, uh, fast filter. Did, did I do it right? I haven't started oh, yeah. yet. What's, oh, yeah. did you? Oh, it was okay, great. Good. It was great. But I got, you know, I got the whole picture in 20 seconds. You know, I got the whole intent and everything. And what I have, uh, Nick, is a rule and this filter, what the filter does is that make you, it, it makes absolutely certain that I've sold myself before I try to sell anybody else on anything. And I think a lot, what a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of leaders, managers do, they put out an idea to see if others will support it before they've actually committed to it. In Interesting. Words, I just stopped doing that about five years ago. So there's a rule. If you don't get an impact from Dan, anything he says, you can just ignore. So I, and I tell people that I said, if you hear me say anything and it didn't show up in the form of an impact filter or a fast filter, which is a shorter version of it, you don't take it seriously. It's not real. It has no reality. To, you don't have to respond to it. But if you get an impact filter for me, it's 100%. We are going to do this. And I have to tell you, you know, your diagram that you just showed me. I keep things very contained with a very, very small number of people and there's total clarity. If you don't, yeah. if you don't see it come in this forum, there's yeah. no reality to it. Well, yeah, I, I call it the scavenger hunt in, in companies. And that's, that's how I refer to the problem is, you know, and the bigger your team gets, the more the scavenger hunt becomes an, an issue. Well, but do you know, and who's terrible at this is some of these high tech bosses who, project all sorts of wishes and, and yeah. God, God, I mean, they're public companies and God, it must oh. totally confuse investors and totally confuse 
everything. And they think they're neat, you know, that, the, wow, you know, everything. I said, you guys are doing real damage. Once you told me about this concept of simplifier multiplier, I then every person I see or that I collaborate with, I'm like, just passing it through that mental model. So by the way, the people in your free, in, in strategic coach, not, and this isn't supposed to be just, a, I'm not trying to throw a promotion, but you deserve it. It's amazing, both the clients and the staff you have. I've gone very close with quite a few of the free zone frontier people. And uh, one of my collaborators, plus really close friends is, is Lee Richter, who is a multiplier. So, and also Joe Polish is a collaborator with multiplier. me, who's a, another multiplier. So do you find that there's a, a natural synergy where a multiplier will collaborate with a simplifier? Yeah. And the reason is neither of them are tempted to do the other person's work. I mean, oh, yeah. that, <laughs> there's no, there's, have, there's no they conflict. Have, they haven't a thought in mind of ever doing what the other person doing. So they grant you a hundred percent ownership of your, your skill area. And I think that that respect is instant. And I think there's a, an excitement. Oh God, I've got somebody now who can, do this part of my work that I never have to do again. And I think it's, um, there's a real energetic magic to it, you know, that uh, happens when I do it. And I, you know, I mean, I go back to Babs and I, I mean, it was like instantaneous almost when we met each other and we didn't have any of this language. We didn't have this understanding, but all of a sudden things popped. She loved it. I loved it, you know, so it's great. I think make great marriages have that, you know, I think, uh, Great, great marriages have that kind of magic. And, you know, there's a lot about business. I mean, if you think about it long range, that resonates with a great marriage. What do you see in terms of the impact that all this is having? I know we, we talked about it before, but just to circle back, what role do you think technology is going to be playing with the future of work? Where do you, how do you see work changing, you know, in a year from now, what, what do you see as kind of some permanent changes that happen from this? Yeah, well, I think that the the best full model that we have to understand what's going to happen is Gutenberg and reading, you know, literacy. It's uh, I think what you're going to have is that uh, we've been a very, very, for the most part, technologically illiterate, okay? I mean, it was somewhat abated by the cell phone because so many people operate by cell phone, but it it was a skill, but for the most part, it wasn't a useful skill as we had understand it in a work setting. We, you know, they, they got familiar with talking to people remotely and that, that was a good thing. But I think what's going to happen now is that the internet will now be printing and literacy in the 21st century. That changes everything. It changes every structure in society. You were talking about you know, the future of work, well, all work structures will now have to be technologically literate. You're, you're a nothing if you are not technologically yep. literate. And that goes with, that's not one consideration. That's a hundred different considerations, yep. you know, mar- marketing, sales, uh, operations, operations, every, everything. The interesting thing about it is that printing was really interesting. I mean, that 150 years after after printing were some of the bloodiest times in Europe. I mean, it was just carnage for because it threatened every structure. You know, the average person could read was a, more literate than the monarch. You know, the you knew the Bible. You know the you know, you knew the scriptures better than the priest did, and, and everything else. And you could call him on it. You know, you could call him on it. And I think the same thing now. So you'll see enormous political upheaval. When the pandemic started, I said, you know, this isn't this isn't the cause of anything. This is the symptom of something. I think a lot of political structures are falling apart. And, uh, you know, the, for, first of all, I think in the end, uh, China will be uh, will be blamed for this. Uh, First of all, because a lot of people want to believe that. And I think there's more people who want to believe that than don't want to believe it. Everything seems to point that they certainly had something to do with it. But I don't think it was intentional. And I even think that the way that they, you know, that they responded to it was intentional. It's just a, it's such an ungodly, badly managed country that this sort of thing could happen and get out of hand. I really appreciate this conversation, you coming on and spending the time, we'll definitely do this again. Where could people go to find out some more about yeah, Strategic Coach and your, this yeah. content? Strategiccoach.com. You know, it's uh, you just go. Pretty simple. Fortunately, we've really done a 
fantastic job of up, upgrading our website. Our, you know, and it's gotten a lot simpler. It's gotten a lot easier. It's gotten a lot friendlier. And uh, so it um, happened in good time because it was last year when we did it. So anyway, but it's a lot of fun. You know, I mean, I'm I'm in th- at the stage where entrepreneurship is all enjoyment for me, you know, and collaboration, especially with entrepreneurs yeah. is well, a lot of pleasure. And I look forward to I, our growing collaboration. I am too. I'm looking forward to speaking at the event next year. It's timely, actually, that all this is happening with remote work and we had that set up. So. Who knows? The summit may be remote. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm excited for the collaboration and we'll we'll have to do this again soon. But thank you so much for your time today. This was awesome. Thank you, Nick. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Dan and that you're able to action some of the ideas we discussed on how to thrive in scary times, as well as how to get your business ready for the future of work and being remote. Be sure to check out the Scary Times Success Manual in our show notes and head to strategiccoach.com to see what Dan and his team are up to. And once again, if you want help improving your top line and bottom line revenue in your business, go over to getleverage.com. We have a resources page for the podcast, getleverage.com slash podcast. This is episode 65. So take a look at that. And we would love to help you and your business, not just survive, but thrive during these scary times. And finally, please don't forget, we would really appreciate it if you rated this, shared it with your friends, subscribed so that we can get this out to as many people as possible. Stay safe.